This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to the rainy set safari here in, well, South Africa. And you can see the Egyptian geese are just swimming away and there is a little bit of rain on its way too. Yay! Everybody get your raincoats and shower caps and any of those things out that you normally would keep yourself dry in. We're going to try and stay dry today. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today, well, I have the pleasure of... Uh, being filmed by BK, who I've not worked with yet, one of our new wildlife we, wildlife filmmaker, because, you know, cameraman, I mean, I feel like they deserve a better title. Remember to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or talk to us via the YouTube chat. A little bit later on, all the last 45 minutes of drive, we will be having a school drive too. And we've got James out and his entourage. So Colly and Tushala are on with him. And Steve Ovo is going to be walking. But I'm not sure how long Steve is going to be walking for. Because the entire afternoon... Well, actually, no, not the entire afternoon. You know me, I like to exaggerate. Um, basically, the thunder has been brewing. The clouds have uh, sort of got bigger and bigger. And it is, well, drizzling a little bit now. Maybe we can... Maybe we can try and uh, avoid it. So we're going to go to Chitwa Chitwa. But there are other things that can also happen out on safari, especially when Steve's on foot. You never know what that's going to go. I don't know. Let's just go to him and see what he's going to do this afternoon. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We are bushwalking again in the afternoon. My name is Steve, joined by Craig on camera, and we've got Rexon looking up this this afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm sure Taylor has told you all of the necessary ways to get hold of us. We would like to hear from you. Just a vehicle driving past you. We've got to be very polite and wave to everybody. So we're going to head down towards our western side, see if we can find any tracks or activity of Shudu and the little Hukudulus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes, it would be. Um, please throw your questions, hashtag Safari Live, and comments as well. Uh, we'll also put them in the YouTube chat stream, at FC. Um, we would like to hear from you, and obviously if there's anything specific you'd like us to focus on in this afternoon, as Taylor said, it's potentially going to rain. There's a huge system building up in the west over there. Maybe it's going to come, maybe it's not. Anyway, we're going to be sort of keeping our ear to the ground, and if it gets a little bit too hectic, we'll have to go back that way and open up the tent. But hopefully we'll manage to get to the first official afternoon bushwalk of 2019 underway and successful. So no doubt we'll probably be finding some elephants along the way, but we're going to be specifically looking for some tracks of Shadulu. But if there's anything, like I said, that you'd like us to discuss, you're most welcome to throw them in there. Kind of a um, interests, points of interest for the afternoon drive. Kirsten would like us to focus on platypuses. Well, Kirsten, um, I don't really know what to say. Um, sure. <laughs> Um, I, I was very disappointed, in fact, when I went to Australia. I even went to Steve Irwin's Australia Zoo, and I didn't see a platypus. What's that about? You'd think you'd go to the zoo and you'd find a platypus, wouldn't you? I even went to Tasmania, where a friend of mine assured me we'd be able to find one. We didn't find it. So that is an animal still on my bucket list. It's a strange animal. It's, a, it's almost like a mammal. It's got a furry animals with a duck beak and they come in eggs. It's just the weirdest, weirdest thing ever. And well, while we move on through the thickets, trying to stay dry, jump on board. We're going to go over to Trish, who would like to say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Actually, let me just stay here for a sec while I address you. Welcome, of course, always a pleasure to have you on board. I am Trishala and I have James behind camera with me. Yes, such an aggressive man. No, I lie. Very good teacher. Anyway, I am here. <laughs> I am here at the Hyena Den, always one of my favorite places to be at. And I'm hoping that the adults will be around and especially that those cubs will be around. So let's head on in. Remember to use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and the YouTube chat stream, of course, to communicate with us and chat to us. We would love to hear from you. So here we are entering Hyena Paradise. Their best 
best den by far. We have the lovely plunge pool in front of us. I've often seen Corky lying in there that she smelt so bad that day. I actually wasn't sure if it was her disturbing the water or it was actually just Corky being smelling horrible. Ah, hello. Somebody's home. Let's just get a nice position in here, not too close. Hey. This looks, let us have a nice, good look at her ears. I always find that ears are a good characteristic, except for the fact that they can often get into fights and then you get rips and tears. Let's actually listen to her for a moment. Now, that sound, I've heard it often, and I usually hear it just before they call their cubs out. But I am, and my first instinct was that this is actually pretty. And this is pretty, I wonder whose cubs she's calling out because her cubs, ha I haven't seen them actually inside of the den. I've seen them around the den, um, but not really inside. And I've seen her cross into the other reserves. And I, oh, hello. <laughs> Cute thing. Gosh, I, I love seeing them. Love seeing them. And when they're kind of this kind of age, they look so lanky. But I'm still trying to figure out if this is actually Pretty's cub or is it? Turn around. So I am looking for. So we know that June's two cubs are the really little black ones. And the only other one that would be this age. Witnessing their greeting ceremony. There you go. So, what they'll do is they'll extend their penis or pseudo penis and then they will they will lick it, smell each other, and that's the way they greet. And usually, the one that lifts their leg first is the submissive one. Now I'm going to hang around here and in the meantime let me send you over to Taylor and I'll investigate what's going on right here. It's big, eh? Hello everybody. We found a bird up in the tree. Ah, not very happy with us. Huh, I'm ex exhausted, says this bird. But I'm trying to figure out what exactly it is. But let's, shall we play the guessing game? Is it a juvenile martial eagle? I don't know. It might be. I haven't seen one for such a long time. I, th I think it is a juvenile martial eagle. Does anybody disagree with me? It's exceptionally large, so look at the size of its feet. Look at those talons. They basically grip right round that branch that it's sitting on. And that's awesome. Kirsten, the bird expert in Final Control, agrees with me. But what about a juvenile African fish eagle? <sighs> no, I think it is a, um, a wonderful martial eagle. Very cool. Can you hear the squirrels? They're very unhappy. They're the Egyptian geese. And that's just kind of normal. Ah, oh, wonderful. King Quad, you've said definitely a juvenile martial eagle. Well, phew. Thank goodness, the pressure to identify birds, it's quite tough out here. A lot of the presenters don't let on how hard it is to identify some of these birds, but it really, really is. But it's beautiful the way that it's just sort of perched up there. It's a pity we don't have the blue sky, because that would have been a great screenshot, but snap away nonetheless. It's a good one for the archives, because it's, you know, out in the open, which is quite nice. I wish I could show you the squirrel, but the squirrel is hiding away very well, as it should be. 
because I would not want to be out and about with a juvenile martial eagle. Well, even though it's so big, it's just going to be exceptionally inexperienced at catching things. So it will still go for smaller things, like maybe other uh, birds, like guinea fowl and Franklin, those types of things, or spur fowl, and then something like an unsuspecting squirrel, a mongoose, those dwarf mongoose we saw on the sunset safari yesterday afternoon. That would def well, this bird would definitely swoop down and grab one of those. So now everything will be hiding away. And then fish. If there's any big catfish that are out of the water that maybe the eagle have left behind, I wouldn't be surprised if they gobbled down on one of those. And we always see the adults and they're typically feeding on monitor lizards. I mean, I can't tell you how many silhouetted shots I have of an eagle angling a monitor lizard against the sunset. But I'm keep you keep back. Not this lanky, lanky creature. Hello, you are so curious. Now, you guys are absolutely 100% correct. You guys say that's quirky, and when she came clear, I could see, uh, came closer, I could definitely see the little bit of dangly bits on her ear. So that is telling me that that definitely is quirky. Now, I used to look, Plonk had quite an obvious sort of semicircle on the one side, but I can't see it clearly yet. James, can you just zoom into that bit there? It looks like a C, an upside down C. Yeah. There we go, just on his thigh. So for me, I would say that that is punk. That's something that I've looked for before. It seems to have, be, to have been a lot darker previous times. Now they've just moved behind us, which is a bit awkward, but I'll try to reposition, but she is very, very close. Now, it was also interesting to see that um, June's two cubs had come out just briefly and when they did Plonk greeted them in the same sort of ceremonial way and they lifted up their legs first which tells me that he is obviously higher ranking of course we know this theoretically but oh, hello hello <laughs> come and say hi so we can figure out who you are there you can see the little one popping their head out there. So it was really nice to see that. I'm just making sure that one's not plonk. Nope. Um, it was really nice to see the, the smaller ones immediately lift their leg up so that they're demonstrating that sort of um, subordinance, whereas before we kind of just only knew it. So cool. I love the size of their ears in proportion to their body. It's just so big. Cindy wants to know how big this hole is that the hyena cub is actually climbing out of. Well, you can see that the older ones can also manage to climb out of it, and but the adults will not fit into it. And that's a great thing because the predators can't fit into it either. So it's a safe place for the cubs. I would estimate, um, I would estimate probably three ruler lengths, maybe two and a half ruler lengths. Please excuse the pole that we have there and the aerial that you're seeing. We do have the rain covers on, and that is because the weather is looking just a slightly gloomy. It looks like it's going to be wet, not too, and then not too much time. Now look at this, look at the ears pulled back. Plant lifted his um, his foot up first. Well, obviously, you know the things that we read; they're not always one hundred percent. And I'll often find that I'll often see that. Just watch right here. There's so much happening. 
like I was saying, we often read lots of things and it's nice to see it in nature because it might only come from one person's observation. Let's watch here. So cool. I am going to stay here and watch this interaction. There's so much going on here. And Taylor has got a lot going on as well. A massive, massive croc. So let's go over to... Look at how epic our afternoon is. You've got hyenas and we've had a juvenile martial eagle. And now Kirsten tells me that this is Snappy, but I can't believe it. Snappy was not so big just a couple of months ago. And I haven't been gone for that long, let's be honest. Um, so I'm surprised. I mean, this crocodile is probably about two and a half ruler lengths. And we know that when crocodiles hatch, they're about 30 centimeters or so and they normally double in size for the first couple of years and so I don't know I feel like there were some other crocodiles that were also around that were sort of uh, a little bit bigger than this one but anyways it's quite cool we've come out on this well as the afternoon has cooled down and sitting up here on the Chitwa Chitwa dam wall to try and get all the heat look at that you can actually see it's come from the right hand side we to see whereabouts it crawled from you can just sort of see the tracks in the sand i'm not going to get out and show you because even though that's a little crocodile i'm probably going to scare it and what happens if it snaps at my ankles i wouldn't want that to happen at all and it's very interesting look how its colors finally starting to change so when they first hatch they're beautiful they're yellow and uh, sort of with different colored browns and black blotches all over them and they're really impressive and that helps them camouflage a lot easier in the shallow water but as they start to get older, they lose that. They lose those all those spots and they sort of be become one uniform color. And their underside, their, their belly, is, is a lighter color than the top half. But that's awesome to see. It's nice to see so many crocodiles now. One day, in like 10 years' time, we'll come here and some of the crocodiles will be the same size as Vladimir and Boris. Well, maybe not quite the same size, but, you know, getting there. Now, Kopal, the biggest crocodile I've seen has to be one in Zambia, although there were some monsters on the banks of the Mara River, to be honest. But when I first was in Zambia many years ago, I'll never forget seeing a crocodile that was about five meters, and it was just sunbathing on the bank, and it was so fat, and it had pushed itself up. We were on the boat, and we kind of saw it at the last minute, and then it lifted itself up and dived into the water, and I was like... I, well, firstly, I was super shocked because I didn't realize how quickly crocodiles could run on land. It was the first time I'd really seen a crocodile move. And then, of course, the sheer size, the splash that it made as it hit the water, I was, you know, my jaw was dropped on the floor. But watching the crocodiles in the Mara were really interesting because when we first got there, there was really thin, maybe feeding on fish here and there, maybe the odd carcass or you know, impala or whatever animal that, you know, gets too close to the water and forgets that there's crocodiles in them. But as soon as that migration comes, they're like triple in size in just a matter of weeks. So that was always really impressive to see things like that. But that's so cool. I'm so happy to see this little crocodile. I've been looking for the others. I haven't seen any more. So I'm sure they're around. I'm still just completely confused as to why Chitwa Dam hasn't got any water. I don't know if it just hasn't rained in this area, you know, because Buffleshook Dam has got a fair amount of water in. Uh, Twin Dams has got some water in, but I haven't really gone to see what Treehouse Dam or anything like that looks like. And yes, it is common. And if you look, look at the distance from where the crocodile is. So I'll point it out to you. That, that's the crocodile there. And you can see the water is just here. So it's really not that far away at all. And then just on this side, we won't really be able to see it. But if you know the area well, down in the drainage line, just below that sort of house in the distance, just in there, there's all water as well. And that's probably where that crocodile has come from. That's the ideal spot for a young well, actually, this crocodile's all right now, but when they first hatch, somewhere down there, out of the way, not a lot of competition in the water. Oh, check, BK, there's one of the big crocodiles. Can you see it? Just to the right of this fish eagle that's in that tree. Yeah, there we go. Here's a nice big crocodile. This is working 
perfectly. I love it when nature does this. Um, so, so yeah. And and if you were following, I'm not sure if you're one of our newer viewers, but maybe some of the older viewers can um, share some screenshots of where we've had Vladimir, was it Vladimir on foot? I had a sighting with Vladimir on foot and so did Brent. It was really cool. And we were in the middle of nowhere. There was no water in any of the pans. So when dry season arrives, so the winter in this area, a lot of the watering holes and the mud wallows, they all, they all completely dry up. So, so, so they move very, very far distances. It's not uncommon. It's also probably something that you don't see, you know, and they're also not walking through the of the bush like us so during the day they don't want to stay out in the open they probably tuck themselves away under a bit of a shrub and that's exactly what we did when we were finding crocodiles out of the water that's that's sort of where we were finding them but that's a big crocodile that is either mr or mrs croc mr i've forgotten who's who now it's really hard trying to focus and then learn new characters and then you forget some of the old ones it's terrible but anyways that'll be most likely the parent of that little crocodile that we saw on the road. And there's so many more around here. Now the wind is starting to pick up. Now it kind of feels like it's not gonna rain at all. Which will work in our favor. I'm okay with not getting wet, that's for sure. And the crocodiles just come to rest now. I've also noticed that there are hardly any hippo here. I mean, there's a few where the bar might be in the way. Sorry, we have got the rain roofs on in preparation. Let's see, I bet that bar is gonna be in no, oh no, it's not. There's a hippo. I thought that bar the one of the bars from the roof is gonna be in the way. So there's a couple of hippos here, but not nearly as many um, as we used to seeing. And and I'm presuming that's because the water is drying up and there's not a lot of space. So the bulls are all gonna be competing um for this area. There we go. Must be a boy. Was it a male? Maybe. Very cool though to see. So I'm just trying to think, one group at the back, one group here. There's maybe three small pods of hippos where we've counted so many more in the past, but that's what happens. They'll have to move on to other areas now. Right, we're gonna leave Chitwa Dam. We're gonna head towards the airstrip and see if we can relocate on those wild dogs. I'd like to see them. Off you go back to Trishala and her group of hyena. Well, good luck with finding the wild dogs. I'm sure that'll be quite a feat if she does. I hope she does. In the meantime, I have the whole lot of the cubs are here. We've got June's cubs here. Please excuse the pole again. We've got June's cubs here. We've got Pretty's cubs and we have Plonk Corky's one. Now, June's cubs were born in January. So they're about a month a month and a bit. Obviously, these are estimates. Oh, where are you going? Where is he going? Now, there's a, one of June's little ones uh, is still here the in these bushes, probably behind the pole. No, it's not behind the pole. Um, so I was saying that June's cubs are born in in Japan, so they're a month and a bit, and you can obviously see that they're already black and very small, and then. Corky's Plonk was born in in September, but Pretty's cubs, the two other older ones, were born in in August. So they're just that much older than uh, <laughs> they're just that much older than Plonk is. Sorry, sometimes when I look at James, it's so distracting he can be. <laughs> hey, little one. And I remember when Plonk was sort of this age and tiny and black, just like this, he never ventured far from the den. And whenever he did, the same noise we heard or sound that we heard Corky make when she was calling out, she would just make that mm, mm, sort of irritated that he would run off too far and then she'd pick him up by the neck and drag him back out. And I'm actually surprised to see Oh, there she comes back. I'm surprised to see that this little one is not as curious as Plonk was at that time, but Plonk is high ranking and he would have felt that way. And I'll explain why I say felt that way from the time that he was that age as well, a month or two. Because from what I've read, dominance and 
rank does of course have a lot to do with the social aspect of the whole clan and I suppose the way in which his mother brings him up, if I can say that, if I had to link it to the human terms. But it also has a lot to do with biology. And Plonk would have, during the time that his mother was pregnant with him, and an influx of all these hormones would come to him while he's still in the womb, without a sub, a subordinate female would not actually have or not be able to uh, to provide to their child Patrick wants to know why these hyenas look so clean today Patrick I don't know if it's just their camera face and um, maybe they knew today was going to be the day because they have evaded me for the last couple of times that I've come to the den. Maybe they've decided to pretty up a bit. Or maybe, for once, they've decided not to, st to bathe in the cesspool out front. <laughs> and they look a bit cleaner. She always has this kind of annoyed look and the tone in which she does it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that it's different when she's at the den and calling them and when she's actually annoyed with them. And this one sounded like a bit of an annoyed one. As to say, oh, you've all run off. I don't have an eye on you. Of course, she does have a babysitter here as well. Tsaka. That's what you guys have identified him as. And I will 100% agree with you guys. Thank you for that. We have Tsaka and he has the wound on his thigh so very easily identifiable for now it's always nice when they have those kind of things and you can easily pick out who's who but a lot of the time those things just like the ears and the wounds in the ears they can heal up and then they're not as clear but those things are what attract us or we notice first and then we start to see all the other differences Mr. and Mrs. McDonald would like to know if hyena cubs have their eyes open when they are born. They do. They have their eyes open and they have teeth erupt already. How intriguing is that? They are very robust, even at birth. But those set of teeth that um, form at birth, they, they have to lose those teeth. And then at about 15 months, the new set of teeth will be fully grown. And that will be the teeth that they take into adulthood. They are very robust. You can even see it in stature. But there's a few things that they lack when they're little. And that is the their back legs seem to be quite weak and they can be quite gangly looking. And they'll you often see them trip over things as they walk through because your know, front legs go first and the back legs sort of give a little bit so it's one thing that they're a bit weaker in and the other thing is the hyena has a massive skull and all these strength in their jaws a hyena skull can weigh about three kgs that's the same size as a lion's skull so that is massive and that's how they can generate all this force and that takes a long time to develop so the little ones do not have the strongest bite yet so things have seemed to been settled down here a little bit. There was a bit of a frenzy when everyone seemed to greet. I will try and move and get a better position, maybe around the den. In the meantime, let's go over to Steve, who has a little eagle for you. Thanks, Trish. So awesome to have the hyenas out at this time of day. It might be the looming weather conditions, uh, but very special to have them. Well, we've stopped to have a look at a small plant uh, called Wetheria. Well, Fairy Indica is a scientific name, also commonly known as snake bite bush, and I'll explain to you exactly why it's given such a name. Um, the root itself can actually be dug up and burnt in a metal container, and then the ash that you can collect from that is then applied with animal fat directly to a snake bite injury, which I find very, very interesting. Obviously, ideally, you should always seek medical attention 
Um, but what exactly it does is hard to say, but it definitely has properties with regards to healing fever and can be applied or can be used in the method of teething, eating the plant itself, um, and then it also helps to bring down potential fever. Um, so obviously those are two completely different elements out there in the African wilderness, but the teething is something we were chatting about the other day. Someone asked, what do elephants do if they're teething? And well, of course, they must eat this plant. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but the root is also said to be very purgative, so if you're going to get the ash of it, you want to make sure that if you're going to eat it, that you don't swallow it, because there's a very good chance that's going to cause you to vomit, and everything's going to come out of your bottom. Very good. That's what a purgative does. Purgatives are caused to cleanse the blood. People like to cleanse their blood in Africa. It's a very common thing with drinking salt water and things like that, trying to just avoid everything that we have. And a lot of people do little cleanses. Oh, harvester termites are out, Craig. There we go. The harvester termites are out. There's a little hole in the ground. Look how busy, busy, busy they can be. Quite a lot of melanin inside of them but here you can see the youngest termites are the pale ones that generally don't stray too far from the nest um, as they get older they get uh, more melanin in them and they're at risk of being obviously eaten or whatever it is when they leave uh, but the fresh brand new termites generally stay inside the den for a period of time and these animals are mainly more active when the clouds cover and there's not too much sunlight, although they do have much more potential of gathering food in the sunlight than other termites do. Incredible size of vegetation that they pull in. Patrick, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously, if the cloud cover comes over, the termites will come out and they'll be very active. Um, in very hot conditions, most insects are not as active because it's just too stressful. Uh, but heat definitely does influence the movements of termites and other insects. And that's why some insects are dark, because when they're black, the sun warms up very quickly. So in the early hours of the morning, sunlight can warm them up. They can get very active very quickly. And then when the heat of the day really comes on, then most of them are much more inactive. Uh, but that's when these guys are very busy underground. So I'm not sure exactly how um, weather conditions affect many of the other termites, but I do know the harvester termites, when the UV light is diminished somewhat, they become a lot more active. So normally in the dusk and dawn, but in the middle of the day if the cloud cover has moved in. So as the name harvester termite implies, and they are gathering all of these cellulose materials, which they'll take back into the den, into the nest, and they don't grow fungus on them. And they actually have cellulase within their gut and able to digest cellulose. So they don't need the symbiotic relationship with fungus, hence why harvester termites don't have burrows. And uh, what I found very interesting is that the distribution of the bat foxes are almost 100% exclusive to where harvester termites occur. So I find that very interesting. Um, in the Mara, they don't get harvester termites, but yet we do get a lot of bat foxes. So down in the Kalahari and the Kruger, that's where bat foxes occur, where we find these guys. But up in the Mara, well, they feed on other insects mainly, which is very cool. I do like my bat foxes. How nice is that? taking leaves and everything underground, which they're then able to digest. And similarly, like other termites, they break them all down and then that organic material gets redistributed into the soil and, well, the circle of life continues. Well, the circle of life at hyena dens normally starts with babies inside holes in the ground. Looking around because... Yes, and Steve is talking about bat-eared foxes and these huge ears on this little one really looks like a bit like a bat-eared fox. It's look a bit disproportionate at the moment. Now, he's just picked up a bit of, I suppose, dried up root, something like that. And he almost wanted to give it to us as a as an, a peace offering, like, a, like, you know, in a way your dog kind of brings the most obscure things back into the house to give it to you as a present. I felt like he was going to give me a present there. But then he turned around, showed me his backside and decided, no, I'm keeping this toy and I'm going to chew it. Very, very cute. So we still have Plonk and Corky here. 
and we have Ta uh, Taka sitting all the way at the end. Remember, we also had June's cups and we had Pretty's cups here too, but no sign of Pretty or June. This is really interesting for me to see because does this mean they all live at this den? Are they just visiting? Very cool. Sometimes I actually see, like, can you see how he's using his, his teeth? He's trying to get all those muscles to, to work and develop. So cool, guys. Oops. It's such a pleasure to watch them. It is. So this is the first time that I've seen all of them at the den together. Uh, and I didn't, I really didn't expect um, Pretty's too to hop out that den as well. Like I said, I haven't ever seen them emerge from the den. I've only ever seen them around the den. So it was quite something in one take to see them all. <laughs> I can't imagine that was too tasty. Nevertheless, maybe you need a chew toy. I always like how the, the folds in the face are like, a, like an old man almost. Sonia would like to know if there's anything that a hyena won't eat. That is a big question, Sonia. From, oh, from what I know, no. I have seen, I have seen Pretty just before we were, we were unsure if she had um, given birth, oh, sorry, June. We were unsure if we, she had given birth, but we could see that she had, um, her teeth were quite big and swollen, so we were not sure if she had given birth, if she's still about to give birth or what. And I saw her gobble up some lion poo without an issue. I could smell it from all the way where I was parked, and I was not even, not even 20 meters. It might have been even more than that away from her. And I could smell this poo. And there she was. She walked past it. She said, hmm, the smells are right. She went around, she gave it a sniff, and then she proceeded to eat it. And I, oh, my reaction was quite, uh, I, I didn't know what to say. I was shocked. So I've seen them do that. I've heard that they will eat, um, well, they will kill another hyena, and I think they would not have a problem with eating it either. And I've heard that they have eaten uh, a lion before. So there is really, I mean, you name it, and they'll have a go at it. I don't know about fish. I can't say that I've read anywhere about fish. James says that at Chitwa, that has been an occurrence. So there you go. Name something and ask, and I'm telling you they would have eaten it. In the meantime, let us go over to Taylor, and she'd like to just update you on what's going on. I feel like hyenas would love to indulge in a bit of fish, especially if it's fresh. Or actually, no, they eat anything, so they probably wouldn't mind. Right, we are on the go. We're searching for more evidence of the wild dogs. So we saw where they were laying, but it looks like everybody in the Sabi Sand uh, today was grading roads. So they obviously got up and they've moved away. 
I uh, can't really see where all their tracks go. I saw one set of tracks look like they were going south, but then the rest of the pack weren't going south. So we've kind of just done like a little circle and I haven't seen anything moving this way, but there's always a possibility that I miss tracks. We know this, I miss com animals completely. So um, we won't write that off just yet. Let's just have a look. Okay, so I'll show you some suspicious things. It's not a great view, but it's a view. Over there in the distance is a battler eagle. We will show you in two seconds. So this is where the dogs were laying, was around here. Can you see it just hidden in that bush? You, oh yeah, you're on it, it's just, here we go. Talk about camouflage. So, and there is the battler eagle. Hello. Can tell that it's a battler eagle. See that sort of grayish yellow skin on its face, see how the feathers are sort of missing, that's quite characteristic, and then that brown plumage they have for the first couple of years of their life. And then their legs, its legs are slowly starting to go red now, you can see just a slight tinge. Now, that's interesting. Normally, tawny eagles and battler eagles uh, fly a lot lower than a vulture, and they're, we know that they're the first ones to typically spot carcasses on the ground. Now, we know vultures will often perch up above lions, Battler eagles and tawny eagles, I haven't really seen them doing that much. I suppose, you know, that could potentially mean a meal. <gasps> They're here! Never mind, I've found the wild dogs. Can you see there? Mm -hmm. ah, okay, let me go in. Found the wild dogs, never mind. They're here. They're just, that's how long the grass is. <laughs> Hi, puppies. Now we gotta get in. Okay, I'm just thinking thinking about that was not planned everybody did you see them the whole time no. did you just see them now oh okay wait stay on, stay on. why are you guys a bit, a bit skittish sorry i just moved literally just moved off the road slightly there we go hi wild dogs i love wild dogs so much they're so much fun brent is going to be so jealous because the last little bit of time he kept trying to get the dogs and i kept trying to help him into sighting because i have unbelievable luck with wild dogs i can't find a leopard but uh, I can normally try and get you some dogs. So this is great. Now, from this morning, obviously briefly listening on the radio, it sounded like that this was the original Investec pack, which is fantastic. That's awesome. I don't know other than today, well, they, yesterday afternoon they'd been seen. And the morning, yesterday morning they'd been seen. I don't know when we at Wild Earth had seen them for such a long time. I know Mr. James Richards did some. We had an incredible sighting. I think they made a kill didn't they? We, they we chased them not we chased them but the dogs were chasing something and we had the drone above it it was so so great oh okay right everybody it seems as though that the gremlins have got hold of us it's a bit of a technical difficulties so we're just going to sort some things on our side uh, but don't go away uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes